Chico and the Man will not be presented this evening, and the Rockford Files will be seen one hour later than normal, so that we may bring you the following special program. Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Coming to Kickstarter from the mind of Franco, the man behind Teen Titans Go to the Library, Faye of the Moon, and All Yeah Comics, comes the new LXT, the adversarial fighting card game, live now on Kickstarter. LXT, Lux vs. Tenebris. Imagine a loved one has been spirited away to a land of terror and torture. Would you be willing to go after them and fight through a horde of acolytes of the Dark One just to get them back? Developed as a role-playing card game that can be played multiple ways. The cards will have full-color illustrations on the front and chock-full of stamps and moves on the back. You can also get the LXT Who's Who book with origin stories and information about all the characters. Still want more? Also available is the LXT Dark Atlas book, filled with pro stories about all the baddies and illustrations from a wide selection of comic artists. There are plenty of add-ons you can purchase separately like comic books, stickers, original art from the game, and more. It's going to be a howling good time. LXT, live, now on Kickstarter. Welcome back, everybody. It's time again for Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntress here. Nice to have a crowd uh, joining us tonight. And nice to welcome back Philip Kennedy Johnson to Word Balloon. Good to see you, Phil. How you been? You too, John. Always a pleasure. How are things? Uh, things are okay. It's a weird day, Phil. I want to address very quickly before we get into our conversation, uh, the passing of Ed Pisker, the man behind uh, Hip Hop Family Tree, X-Men Grand Design, a lot of other books. Uh, a very sad loss today. Uh, we're, I'm going to address uh, that in a uh, tribute podcast tomorrow on uh, the audio side of Word Balloon. If you're an Ed Pisker fan, uh, there are plenty of interviews that Ed and I did over the years that are available here on the YouTube channel. And uh, I'm, I'm very sorry this happened. Mental illness is a serious issue, and uh, uh, it, uh, it deserves uh, more time than uh, I have tonight to discuss it. And uh, I'm very sorry that uh, Ed has made that fatal choice. And uh, in fact, Philip and I were talking uh, this afternoon about uh, people that we knew that uh, sadly took their own lives as well. And it's a it's a it's a tough thing. So, yeah, I'm not sure what to say about it. I um I didn't know I didn't know Ed I didn't know Ed as well as you. Um, obviously, yeah. the whole thing is just the whole situation is so tragic. I um. I yeah, not knowing anyone involved, I I guess I don't have much to say about it. Just just condolences to, I mean everybody. Understood. And yeah, I see uh, people in the chat, and I appreciate the, the good words you're saying about Ed. But we are going to move on and talk about what Philip and I had planned to talk about tonight, and that's some really neat projects. We want to start with a new one, uh, Philip, and that is uh, a brand new book that you've got from Boom Studios, uh, Crocodile Black. Uh, it seems, uh, Phil, with the uh, books we're going to discuss today, that uh, you got both feet firmly in the horror world. Uh, fair comment. <laughs> it, it does seem that way these days, huh? Yeah, it's it's funny how uh, how that kind of shifts from from year to year. Like I um for a while, nobody knew me for horror stuff at all. I definitely um really like horror stuff, and I um I watch and read a lot of it, and um, it's one of my one of one of the genres I kind of consider my home base. I don't bring it to everything because it's you know it's not appropriate for every book, but um, people also see a lot of a lot of echoes of high fantasy in my stuff. Um, this particular story, though, Crocodile Black, there this is kind of some of the influences on this story are things like um, like True Detective, um, Nightcrawler, the film that I really admire, the show Breaking Bad. Like there's there it's kind of a like a psychological 
thriller kind of thing. Like there's definitely some horror elements to it. A lot of that is brought by the choice of artists that I'll get into. But this is a story that kind of gets into um, the early days of COVID. And it's uh, in Crocodile Black, we meet a kind of a loser with no prospects, uh, working a pointless job, living a pointless life, a guy with some hidden trauma that we don't really know much about at first uh, until he chances upon a dead man in his home. Uh, wearing a pair of black crocodile skin boots. And for, for reasons we don't understand at first, those boots change the trajectory of his life. And that guy starts on the path of becoming the person he always kind of secretly wanted to be, which is a dangerous man. Um, and it's inspired by, yeah, those early days of COVID where I, I feel like the whole comic industry was just kind of hiding from it. And it didn't really, uh, creatively, as far as the books that were coming out on the shelf, there were not a lot of books coming out that were really acknowledging what we were all going through. You know, it's, and I saw the same thing in film and TV and games and everywhere else. Like people weren't really talking about it that much. Every now and then you'd see uh, a movie come out that was dealing with it or, um, you know, a, a stream, like something on a streaming platform would acknowledge it in some way. But for the most part, it was pretty, everyone was just kind of pretending it wasn't there. And whenever there was a story that did acknowledge it, um, I don't know. I really, I really took notice. It was, I don't, I don't know if it was, if you felt the same way, but whenever I opened up a book and I'd see, you know, I'm, I'm living in this world where everyone has to, you know, six feet away was kind of the magic number. Everyone had to wear a mask and everything shut down and nobody's seen each other. And you see books and everyone's like, you're seeing a crowded street in New York or metropolis or whatever. And there's like this little voice in the back of my head, like too close. Like <laughs> Everything just looks so different than, uh, than how, than what life looked like then, you know? So I don't know. That yeah, was- I hear you. Man. You know, I, I just finished watching the uh, Steve Martin documentary on Apple. Brand new, uh-huh. just uh, uh, came out this weekend, and yeah. uh, they shot it during COVID. And you see him picking up his cleaning and wearing a mask, or he and Martin Short are writing their two man show. And one of the jokes was, "Yeah, I know everybody wants to stay six feet away from each other. In our case, can we make it sixty feet away?" <laughs> yeah. It's like that. But no, you're right, man. It is it is such a I mean, we're we're really still living in the aftermath of it. And even I mean, I still see the occasional masks on people. Totally. And, you know, people are still getting contracting COVID, even though herd right. immunity seems to have finally uh, taken place, but things aren't the same. And I mean, you know, yeah. whether it's doors closing and I I would I don't know by by you, but oh my god, I can't tell you really like downtown Chicago is half what it used to be because yeah. of all the stores closing and everything. Yeah. I mean, the, the culture seems to be more or less what it used to be before, before everything hit, but there, it was almost like there was this gigantic earthquake that just like tore down a bunch of us. And then now it's now we're like, as you say, it's the aftermath, you know, like there's all these, there's just this, uh, this ring in the tree where everything kind of, you know, there's like this big fire and now, now everything's different. Um, and this, this story takes place in a time like that. Um, it, honestly, even now, and it's only been a couple of years, but it kind of feels like a period piece now because because life feels so different now. But um, yeah, it's about the power of masks, kind of. It's about this guy who I was really struck by the second year of COVID when there was the there's a word for it, like the the great the great resignation or whatever it was, where a lot of people quit their their jobs and um, especially entry level type stuff. People were quitting their jobs. People were dropping out of college for like, whether it be for practical reasons or because, because they never really wanted to do it. Like there, a lot of people were, were dropping out of programs that they never really wanted to pursue anyway. They were just kind of doing what they thought the safe choice was. And um, then they were in COVID and a lot of people were just like, you know what, screw this. I'm going to do the thing I was kind of wanted to do anyway. There was this uncertainty that just permeated everything. Nobody knew what it was going to be like tomorrow. If this, is, if this is just how the world is now. I mean, I'm in, I'm in music as well as comics and nobody knew. I mean, there was a, there was a, there were a lot of people who thought that live music might just be a thing of the past now. Like a, what if, what if live performances is not something that happens anymore in, in big ways? I, you um, read my I, mind, Phil, because I wanted to know, given your role in the army and in music, how did, how did COVID, COVID uh, impact your day-to-day army work? <laughs> My God, profoundly. We were on tour when it, uh, man, we were about to go. We were about, to, yeah, it was it was on the news when we were leaving for tour. We're about to do this big, for anyone who, who's listening who doesn't know, I play in the, in one of the military bands in Washington, D.C. I play trumpet. 
And I'm actually coming up on my on my last year in the army. I'm about to get out. And then you'll be seeing great. thanks, dude. Yeah, it's about to see a lot more comics out of me. Excellent. Um, yeah. So I got I have some projects that hopefully I have the bandwidth to do. Um so yeah, but I've been doing this for you know close to 20 years. And so we we were about to go on tour. Um let's see, that tour was gonna go through the northwest. I think we were going through like Ohio and Indiana, and it was gonna go up to like Minneapolis and, and beyond, I think. Um, we we're about to leave. And, you know, our our whole job, man, is to just to play concerts and meet people afterwards and talk to them up close and shake their hands. And and we get plenty of elderly at those concerts. We get a lot of veterans there. Yeah. And um, in the in the tour brief before we left, um, I was talking about I got I kind of every whenever anyone throws up a question in the tour brief and everyone kind of groans like, oh, my God, it's already been going on for too long. Just shut up and let's get out of here. And I was like, I think we need to talk about this. <laughs> you know, COVID's happening and like people, you know, people are saying that it, you know, it, it, uh, people don't know they're sick for a few days. If anybody in this band gets sick, we're going to be like the plague ships this is, you know, we need to be really careful with things. And I don't know, people just weren't taking it seriously, you know? And then we, we got on tour and I think about a week in, it like they were like uh, we we're starting to see the the audiences kind of thin out, and then they were closing down venues, right? And you know, like we basically had no choice but to go back, and and then we just didn't go on the road again. So I mean, almost as soon as we went back home, um, we turned our rehearsal hall into like a soundstage, and we started streaming shows, and the the, the stages that we did in there like were ridiculous. Like we were all really far apart. It wasn't the whole concert band; it was mostly chamber stuff. Or you know, how many pieces? Or, how many pieces in a chamber uh, arrangement? Well, I mean, it it very it depends on the music on the on what we're playing. We had um, like when we on that tour, it would be like a sixty five piece concert band and a twenty ish piece chorus is what you see on stage, and then you know there's just not space for that. If we're actually spaced out like you're supposed to, there's just no space for that. So sure, when when we went home and started recording, it was all about whatever the music was in that thing. So a brass quintet would play. Our, our brass quintet with drums, maybe, or our big band, the Jazz Ambassadors, would do something. And even then, there was this crazy setup that they would use, or they they would pare down the numbers and they kind of spread them out and make it more of like a, almost like a like a Maynard Ferguson type thing, where it's like this like smaller horn sections. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It's it was a big. Sometimes we'd have like a, uh, like a bluegrass thing, or it was just okay. these, you know, so just whatever the music called for. And we did that for like like well over a year yeah um until we were able to kind of kind of do it again or we record these videos outside highly produced right. videos of us you know in formation outside in uniform you know with the, with the wind blowing all far apart and you know and not not just to actually give people stuff that that they would like content that they needed but also to to make clear the the message like hey this matters we're taking it seriously like don't be an idiot yeah um so yeah it just changed everything and we didn't know what if, if I mean, people thought that might have been just the way that like, this is how we do business now, we didn't know if, if it was ever coming back. No, I, t I totally understand. So, um, God, you know, I never understood uh, again, though, in that case, you're all in the same room doing something together. I would see bands, you know, it looked like they were all in different places. And I don't know yeah, how the yeah. hell they mix that because, hell, even this conversation we're having right now, sometimes there's like a second or half a second of a delay between yeah, us yeah. And, Man, and i don't know how you how you integrate you know uh playing together with those kind of challenges well you just need a you need a banging um internet connection for one thing like there can't be, can't be any can't be any lag and you need something where you can really hear them it's it's never ideal like even if you're even with when tech is just as good as you can really realistically get it's still not the same um, i understand but, but it's doable like there are there are there's software you can use to actually rehearse with people virtually and people use it. People didn't obviously COVID is where that stuff thrived, um, but people still use it. Fair enough. A couple comments yeah. because I want to get these in before these people have to go. Uh, Jake Murphy says, I can't stay long, but I do have a burning question for Philip. Given the spirit of cooperation seen in the upcoming DC Marvel omnibuses or omnibuys, uh, can we <laughs> expect a Superman Hulk? crossover from you so oh man uh i don't i think expect is, is is a bit strongly worded uh i can't say that it's a sure thing i would love that i don't know man i feel like the corporations hate each other more than they used to <laughs> i don't know <laughs> i feel like it would be uh 
I feel like the Cold War has heated up quite a bit over the generations. I don't think uh, I don't think the, the days of amalgam is coming back anytime soon. I would love that though, man. I'd be I'd be game as hell to do that. Um, I would love to see you do it because, again, I think your run, and we're going to get to your Hulk stuff in a second, but also uh, your Superman run is fantastic. Oh, and, thanks, man. Uh, yeah, absolutely, man. And and really, over the years, we've had some great Hulk Superman crossover stories. You know, Dave Gibbons and, um, uh, damn it, uh, Nexus. Uh, come on, John. Steve. Steve Rude. Steve Rude did a really oh great Hulk God. Superman yeah. crossover. And it was so great because, you know, Steve can channel – other artists and really had your Kirby Hulk in his drawings and um, a very traditional, uh, I would even say golden age Superman look uh, in that, in that book. So yeah, it would, it would, it would be interesting, you know? God, uh, I'd love it. I would totally do that. I am, um, man. Yeah. I, and I, I'm not done writing Superman. I got, I don't know what's going to come next exactly, but Man, I everyone I'm I'm friends with so much of the DC office and they all know how much I love Superman. Um so I can as long as I as long as I stay healthy, I'm doing more Superman someday. Amen. <laughs> I, Absolutely, I count, man. Count on that. And I'll I do think that if there were gonna be something like it, if the if the powers of be decide there's gonna be a Superman Hulk crossover, I do um I do think I'd be on the short list to do it. So I I would happily do that book. Um let's see here. Ange C is psyched because he's going to be at terrific con so he's looking forward to seeing you there oh, I great. Too, I'll Ange. see yeah, you in August. Ange, Ange is a supergirl hella fan and Superman too of course but uh, Ange has been incredibly supportive online the whole time I was doing Superman stuff so good to see you in here man let's see he yeah. says how tough was it to juggle so big a cast you know that was actually pretty challenging like there were a lot of people in yeah. that cast and the way to do it at least with my limited powers is, was to, um, to kind of bring characters to the fore and background. Um, it was difficult to have, cause there are so many and there are obviously similarities between their power sets and some of their personalities. And so to keep it from getting stale, um, or just really, um, you know, frustratingly busy on the page all the time, we had, to, <clears throat> we had to kind of choose, you know, a few, a few characters, to really focus on over the course of an arc, like in that, in that Metallo arc, it was important to, yeah. you know, I really wanted to show John and, and red son and how they're going to, how they're going to get along. Cause I mean, they're living in his, John's old room and um, red son's wearing his old, wearing John's old shit, you know? So it was, you know, we've, I was struck by how, how okay John seemed when he came back, you know, he was like, Hey, I'm back and I'm good. And um, especially after everything he'd been through and, um, yes we saw a little bit of, of Superman struggle and I showed more of Superman struggle in my own run when he was on war, how the way he connected with it is in part because of his own trauma or losing his kids, all those years of his son's life. So, um, I don't know. I just wanted to, I wanted to see, I wanted to see John maybe not be okay. Like maybe like I wanted to see him being kind of replaced and how, how does that make him feel as a kid who thought he was good? So I felt like John and red son's relationship, um, was really important. Um, and I also kind of wanted to show the way, I don't know, the way that Kara react. Um, to me, Kara was always kind of the, um, kind of the matriarch of the family, even though she is, you know, on their face, she's younger than Superman, but she's really the most Kryptonian of any of them. I wanted to show a lot of that. Um, and then in the next arc, the, um, the new worlds arc, where we, we show the, the alternate, like the, we show Earth Al Ghul and all that. I thought that was the time to really show Star Child's story and how, how she's different from her brother. And so, yeah, it was just a matter of deciding when to bring a character into the foreground and when to bring him into the background, always present, like never absent exactly, but um, just know when their time was to, to flesh them out. Fair enough. I'll get back to the chat in a second. I want to finish us talking about Cro Crocodile Black. Finite series? Yeah. Yeah. Right now it's looking like five issues. Okay. And uh, I know we, we kind of got, I mean, there is an opportunity if the fans are just like rabid for more, there is an opportunity for more, for more arcs, but um, the story that we're telling, I mean, the, just the, the, um, the sequential nature of, of comics, um, the serial nature, I should say, um, kind of makes it feel more like episodic TV kind of, but this particular story feels like more quote unquote movie length where it's like a story that begins and ends like this. There is a, there is a very specific place that 
that this arc is going and there is a very clear finish line at the end. And there, there is potential to do other stories that are also kind of standalones and they're, you know, after that one's done, but, um, but yeah, there's not a, not exactly a cliffhanger right now. It's looking like five issues. So okay. yeah, we'll see. And I, we wow. talked a lot about COVID. We kind of got off, off course with the music stuff, yes. but yeah, please. the, the, um, the big thing about the COVID thing, I, the reason it was important to, to take place, um, in that time, um, was, was kind of twofold. Part of it was just the way, how struck I was by the, the great resignation where people were le like just leaving their lives behind. They took this big calamity as the opportunity to kind of leave their, their lives behind and do the thing they secretly always wanted to do. Um, that was really important for the story. And the other thing is the power of masks. And there are people that just prefer that distance. They prefer to, to be behind a mask and to be able to, to see people that can't see them and to, to feel like there's yeah. somebody else in there, you know, just to, to not be seen people. There are people who prefer that. And um, this character is very much one of those people. And this guy's mask is, um, is this other person's identity. Like he finds this pair of crocodile skin boots. And for reasons that we'll understand later in the story, um, those boots for some reason unlock this crazy trauma in him that he's, you know, again, we'll come to understand what it means later, but the boots kind of become his mask. Like he kind of inhabits this new identity. He finds these boots and he's got this secret that no one knows but him. And he goes back to his, the, you know, his shitty life with his shitty dad and he hates it and he doesn't want to be there. And finally he's just like, what am I doing here? And he just leaves. And he goes back to that dude's house. And he just squats there. And this guy, he get, becomes obsessed with this other person's identity and just kind of, you know, wears this other person who's dead and no one knows he's dead except him. And he wears that person as his own mask. And he kind of just takes on this whole new life. And I don't know, it just seems really liberating. And this is like the darkest version of that story. <laughs> so it's uh, a lot of people kind of reinvented themselves during COVID. And this is a, this is a version of that story, a story of reinvention that leads to like leads to, you know, more trauma and murder and all kinds of dark stuff. But it's like in a really intriguing way that I hope people really resonate with. Dark consequences. Absolutely. Here's some yeah. cover uh, previews. Uh, this is Christian Ward. God, I love Christian. I Good just met stuff. Christian for the first time. We've been fans of each other for a long time. I met him at, uh, we had the same rep at cons, uh, Scott's Collectibles, and he was there at New York yeah. Con last year. And so we finally met and we're going to try to do something together. And Andrea Sorrentino, a couple covers. This is for issue yeah. one. Very cool. God. Andrea is so Big good. Fan. Big fan. I, I reached out to him. And Green Andrea Arrow with, uh, Green Arrow with yeah. uh, Lemire, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. did. He did some. He did some creator own with Lemire as well. Um, yes. Man, Andrea is incredible. You know, Andrea is a huge Alien fan. When I was writing Alien, he said something about that online. As when I was announced as the guy, he uh, he said something online about being this massive Alien fan. So I reached out and I was like, are you serious about that? <laughs> do you want to do something? He was like, oh my God, I'd love that. But he was, he was actually spoken for, for quite a ways out. I, I think with Lemire, in fact, at that time. So we had to kind of come back to it, but look at that. God, I love these covers. This is for issue two, everybody. This is Andreas. Yeah. Uh, issue two cover. There's another one for issue three. I really wish I could show. God, I, I love Andrea. I, All yeah, right. Fair enough. Dude. Um, and uh, Ar uh, Anand R.K., I don't know. Uh, yeah, Anand R.K. Is, uh, is how I see his name written. His real name. I actually, yeah, I don't know Anand at all. Um, but I, I see their name all over the place. And I love this piece. Yeah, pretty creepy. Absolutely, man. Jeez. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's great. And uh, no, I, I, I'm thrilled. And again, I'm glad Boom is uh, giving you this opportunity to tell this story. And it's great, because yeah. you're, you're atypical stories like Last God. Things like that. I'm I'm blanking on. Uh, you did. Um, didn't you do? You did. Did you do Sons of Anarchy with them, or did you do? Um, no, I did. It's funny you say that. I um. I did. It was a greater own thing that was yeah, like I, a couple things. Yeah, my first ever printed book was with Boom. It was Last Sons of America, and then I did Warlords of Appalachia, which was my next book there. And that that cover looks a hell of a lot like a Sons of Anarchy, of Anarchy image. So it's fun that you, funny that you said that because they they were putting out those books at the time and on the on the shelf they were on the yeah the uh, they, they used to have this massive like t uh, like a table that just went all the way around the boom booth at cons and they always put Sons of Anarchy right next to Warlords because they look kind of similar and it's a similar yeah 
Sure. And, no, uh, that's yeah. awesome. I cut my teeth at Boom Man. They were they took a chance on me when I was absolutely nobody, hadn't done anything yet, and I really appreciated that. So I just really wanted to give Boom first first crack at this book if they wanted to if they wanted to put it out, and they said they did. So we're doing it. That's great. Uh, seeking Seeking Superman is intrigued. Excited for this to come out. Can't wait to read it. Starting next Thanks, month, everybody. What's up, Glenn? Good to see you as always. And uh, hell, Andrew, man. Andrew Sweet, very nice. Every time you have Philip on, John, I always make sure to watch it live, no matter what. Uh, happy to have thanks, you back, Andrew. Andrew, happy, that, uh, happy you're joining us. Absolutely, man. Well, in that um, case, you know what? Since Andrew said that, that was really kind. I'm going to find something. Do I don't know. Let me see what I got. I'm going to try to show something. <laughs> show, what do you want to see? I'm going to show uh, Andrew my Whatever. office. We've got, <laughs> we've got Mjolnir from Gods of War Ragnarok. Nice. <laughs> Let's see. I don't like that hammer just spoke to me. Um, we've got, yeah. Here we go. So I mentioned New York Comic Con last year. Yes. And um, Ricardo Federici was there. Okay. And sure. He's he's the guy who he drew the last god, which is now now under the title Felspire Chronicles. Felspire um, Chronicles. The Felspire Chronicles. Yeah, that was. Spire. Pardon me. Yes. Yeah. Last last god. It's either, the original title was Last God, uh, Book One of the Fellspire Chronicles, and then there was like a copyright thing. <laughs> Some like there was okay. somebody else had somebody else had something called Last God, something like the Last. It was like something in Europe. I don't, I'm sure what it was. There was some kind of a conflict, and so now it's out under. It's just the Fellspire Chronicles Book One is how it's how it is now, at least in English. I don't I don't think it's any different in. Uh, oh, thanks, Peter. I don't know if it's any different in the other languages, but anyway, so I saw Ricardo and he's a, he, Ricardo was an Italian artist living in France. He, he's from Rome and he doesn't go to the States all that much. So I saw Ricardo and hung out a little bit and um, he, he, he's selling his original artwork and most of Ricardo's stuff is not inked. Usually his pencils go straight to, to colors because they're so goddamn clean. Um, so he's selling his penciled pages out of the wow. out of the book, and he when he saw me, he pulled this thing out and just gave it to me. And this is the concept for Superman's. Sorry, here we go. No, it's Superman, all good, man. There you for go. Superman's for his War World armor. Yes. This is just, wow. This is just that's just pencil. You could erase it if you want. If you were a madman. Wow. And isn't that cool? Absolutely, Philip, and it, and really. I mean, really, the whole uh, you call it the War World uh, arc of your uh, the War World saga, yeah. War World. I mean, really, it's it's when you take Superman out of his element that I think is both challenging for readers potentially and the character himself. And it's again, it's uh, will the man of Superman travel with him when he's not on Earth? And dealing with something otherworldly, you know, I I think I told you, uh, God, I, I seriously, man, I have issues with names tonight. Um, well, welcome to where I live. I, I'm horrible with <laughs> names always. Well, that's good. You're younger than me, so I feel a little bit better about that. Oh God, the great uh, Black Panther, right? Christopher Priest did oh, yeah. that. Uh, did that also did that great uh, science fiction story? A different, uh, you know, think of Superman Lost. Lost, and yeah. It, oh. And again, it's like, all right, what happens when everything that, you know, he needs to feed who he is is stripped away? Yeah. What does he do? Yeah, up in the sky, uh, Tom King's a great story that yeah. he did. Another great, another great, great story. Yeah, man. And that's the thing. And I, I, I love that because certainly from a power standpoint, you can put Superman in these other things. Hell, I've been enjoying those stories since the Silver Age reprints that I would read as a kid in the 70s. And read those, you know, silly stories that appeal to the ten-year-old in me. But uh, you know, it's great to see that you could tell these adult stories as well, and really challenge Superman. And it's like, all right, what, you know, hey, you're every everything you can count on that keeps you going on Earth, Lois and his family and everything, they're all gone. What does he do? Yeah, I feel like it's those kind of things really make us um, like look closer at those heroes and and see. I mean, man, I want everyone to walk away from a Superman story just like shaking their fists and just, just like, oh God, I want to be what that is. You know, I just want to, I want to be that, but that thing I just saw that, you know, made me feel something. I want to, makes me want to be more than I am, more than I can be, you know? 
And I, you do that in my opinion, like what I tried to do with Warworld was to, um, to ask the question, like, what is, how does Superman save human trafficking victims? Basically, how does Superman save people who don't want his help, who, who have only ever known, you know, the agony and like hate us. Like they're just so full of abuse that all they can do is hate us. And they, they think that Mongols, they're Superman. Like, how do you save someone who doesn't want you there? You know, that was, that was the whole thing like that, the power of the chain and like how does Superman break it when they don't want it to break it. Um, and I'm kind of doing a similar thing now with Green Lantern War Journal where it's, um, it's seeing Green Lantern, seeing Jon Stewart come home from war from, you know, from adventuring and uh, having to help his mom at the end of her life. Yeah. And just yeah. stuff that, stuff that, you know, all of us have to deal with in a way or in some form, you know, um, yeah, how do we, that, how do you, how do you deal with some, like just some, you know, some unfixable thing like dementia, you know? Oh, and, and truly, man, those emotional beats that you see with John's mother, they are heartbreaking because you're watching her slip away. And it's something that a lot of us, have dealt with in our own personal lives. And uh, that's great. Again, in the meantime, John is uh, otherworldly in this other dimension. Doesn't even, the ring doesn't even know where the hell he is. And, right. you know, exactly. Yeah. I thought that was, a. am glad you, I'm glad you noticed that. Like he, um, oh, yeah. yeah, I, man, those, those pages look so Montos. I just, I kept stressing on in the script, how dark I needed those pages to be. And I was even, I was kind of worried about it. I was like, man, is this going to work in a printed book? Like how, this is going to be basically a black page. I really hope this works. It works. And, <laughs> God, it works. Don't worry. Montos, Montos just <laughs> obliterated it. I can't believe how effective he made wow. those pages. It's exactly what I wanted to see. Just completely perfect. Um, Montos is just a miracle worker. And he's fast as hell. It doesn't make cool. sense how good he is and how fast he is. He's a great collaborator and a, just a master of, a, of an artist. That's beautiful, man. Um Seven came out uh, last month, and or yeah, yeah last yeah. month, and then uh, we're a couple of weeks away from uh, issue eight. Here's a preview of the cover, everybody. Yeah, for, uh, for issue eight, gorgeous. Yeah, stuff, this man. this second arc that we're in now, um, mm -hmm. it we're still seeing the stuff with his mom and his and his newly returned sister, um, but we're also seeing a lot of a lot of lore. We're about to kind of flesh out the lore of the Green Lantern Corps a lot more. Yeah. Um, and, and tying it in, we're tying it in with the uh, with the Kirby verse kind of. We're tying it in with some first world stuff as first world is like if Kirby's fourth world is New Testament, what I'm calling the first world is my my stuff is like the Old Testament kind of. It's wow, uh, Old Testament of the DCU. Um, like Olgren, the the god of gods that we refer to in the War World saga, we were we establish in War World saga that Olgren, who's kind of like the Kronos of that of that mythology. Um, got too powerful and too dangerous and too full of grief. And he was, he was torn into seven God aspects by the other gods and sp spread across the multiverse. And one of those, the spark of Algren became, became the, the seed that was at the heart of the war world grew out of it. Basically the concept, the way that Grant said it, Grant, it's funny. I, as I was telling Grant Morrison, this concept, Grant described it more beautifully than I had by far. And he said, like, I love that. He said, said, uh, it's like, it takes seven worlds to make a God. I love that idea. And I was like, Oh my God, I wish I'd said that. That was so great. <laughs> I love that. And Grant is so such a beautiful person. Yeah. His mind um, is so like the Rubik's cube is solved and he's happy to tell yeah, it. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. I always, you know, Oh, that's like DC patrol. I agree. And he, I know Philip does too. Montos is, uh, such oh, a uh, talent absolutely yeah. and funky dude says uh there's a page where right after john revives his sister that's a full page spread that is just her and it's honestly one of my favorites ever that's great yeah thanks for saying that montos is just the kindest coolest person and just a, a joy to work with and honestly i'm so underwater all the time with workload he gets these scripts like pretty close to the wire sometimes and he always crushes it and i'm always apologetic but man i'm just trying to stay ahead of him all because he's fast and he's just he's he keeps me hopping um sometimes he has to sometimes i turn in a script and there's one scene that needs to get tweaked and it's like i have to give him like a partial script which is the worst and i hate doing that but he is so game all the time and just crushes it every time i'm so grateful to work with montos you've am i right the the new lantern we see in war journal is uh, your creation, right? What's his name again? 
Kaolan Shepard is his name. Yeah. And Shep, yeah, Shepard is from another, it's, uh, he's from the world that we see in um, Dark Crisis, World Without a Justice League, where they have these one shot, like, um, what's his name? Pariah makes um, all these different universes basically out of the members of the Justice League who are supposedly dead. And one of them is Jon Stewart. So there's like a Jon Stewart universe kind of, and a world where the rest of the Justice League never existed. So on that world, Jon Stewart is like Superman or, you know, Paul Muad'Dib or whatever. Like the, he's like the one big power around. Yeah. Um, and Shepard is somebody who, he's a Green Lantern who grew up just idolizing John. And um, we see in the, in the backups of the first three issues of Green Lantern, we saw kind of what happened after the issue, after the events of that uh, dark crisis thing, um, kind of get a, an idea of who Shepard is. And then at the end of that, something goes horribly wrong and we get like an, a, a, a big bad gets sent to our universe and Shepard is, Shepard is kind of like the Kyle Reese from Terminator where he comes here to, to save, to save our world, but he has, he has to kind of save John Connor, but John Connor is John Stewart. And he he finds John Stewart, who on his world is like the ultimate Green Lantern ever. He's what they what he calls the gar the guardian and the builder. And he comes here, and John has given up his place in the core because of what's happened in the events of the other book, and and because his mother needs him so bad, and because he's honestly kind of kind of messed up from what he's been through. Uh, so he finds him without a ring, and he's just taking care of his mom, and he's quit the core. And to him, he's just like, "What am I looking at? You're not John Stewart." Uh, and it kind of takes the it takes the events of the first arc for Shepard to learn to respect John and to realize you know, actually he is still this ultimate hero that I knew. And then in the arc that's happening now, John is sent away. We, I mean, Shepard doesn't know where he is, and we're starting to learn um, how the how the Green Lantern Corps ties into this other thing. Like the, it ties in. It try, I try to take all the different parts of what makes John John, and you know, just explore them all in the course of this of this series. Like I'm, I'm checking them out as a as a as an ex marine, as a you know, as a member of the core, as a as a son, as a brother, as a former Dark Star. The Dark Star stuff comes into it. Um, I hope to explore his um, his penchant for dating alien women. <laughs> I would love to get into that a little bit. Sure. So we'll see if we have time for it. But um, but I also wanted to. I love the mythology, man. I love the I love the Kirby stuff. Um, and I wanted to tie it all in. I want to tie it in with my war world stuff, but I also want to tie it into the, the new gods. So we're doing all that. And this, the second arc is kind of where most of that's happening. Uh, that's great. Um, and also, yeah, I, I appreciate how you are building and connecting a lot of DC cosmic in this story. And also Shepard's about to learn with the tease at the end of seven uh, stuff in the book of Oa. So I imagine yeah. the audience laid out uh, some uh, mythology that will, learn more about that's going to tie everything together. Exactly. Yeah. We're about to get into some lore and it's really fun. I love writing that stuff. Um, yeah, man, I'm going to try and I'm con gonna, as we're talking here, I'm trying constantly not to spoil stuff. Cause I just, I want to just talk about every element of it. I understand. Andrew wants to know, um, or pardon me, first funky dude, any plans for you and Jeremy Adams uh, to do a zero a Manicos uh, book across. Well, the yes. Way. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool. There's going to be, there's going to be some, I mean, to call it a crossover, well, I, hmm. there's going to be a lot, there's already a little, of, a little bit of connective tissue, but that's going to get a lot stronger going forward. I got to get Jeremy on, man. Uh, Andrew wants to know. Dude, if you want to talk to Jeremy, you, he'd love to talk to you. Jeremy is super high energy, always super fun to talk to. He, he does a lot of podcasts too. So I, I, he'll be all over it. Yeah. You know, and, and he had that run on the flash too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, much, much oh, beloved. His honestly, his his energy is he did, he's done a lot of anim, excuse me, a lot of animation stuff, and he's perfect for it. I mean, he just his energy as a as a human being as well as as a writer just really fits like that that kind of stuff. And he brings all that to comics as well. His books are always really fun. He just gets the characters, and he's fun to talk to. Andrew's asking if we talk a lot. Yeah, I talk to I talk to Jeremy just about every week. Um. Not every, I mean, not as often as I would love to, but, um, but yeah, at least, at least once every week or two, um, regarding the Green Lantern stuff, we're always kind of, even if it's just like, a, whether it be just a question here and there, or if he wants to kind of talk through an idea that he's afraid might be dumb or that I want to talk to him about, 
you know, we, we just call and just kind of talk through it. It's really fun. I would imagine you have the same editor, obviously. Yeah. On the Green Lantern stuff. Yeah, we do. Who do you know? Uh, what's his name or her name? Yeah. Paul Kaminsky is the, Paul is the senior Very editor good. with that stuff. Yeah. It's um, I'm not sure if Green Lantern is, I don't know if it's officially part of the, the quote unquote metropolis group or if it's just yeah, what group he'd be part of. Yeah. I yeah. I mean, te technically it's a justice league group book. I'm not sure how they divide up some of those rules. I know it's gotten a little more, I mean like the uh, metropolis group is one is still a very defined house. And then the sure. Gotham group is too. The justice league stuff is, I'm not sure if it's still all contained in one thing or if it's getting kind of parsed off in various directions, but, uh, but Paul, regardless, Paul is the guy for those books. And uh, Jillian Grant is also, is the assistant on those. Um, they're I both great. There have been every now and then someone else will stick their head into. Sometimes somebody else comes on, on board for a bit. She Sui Salty 3.0 wants to know if editorial ever acknowledges that John is 10 years younger than Hal or Guy, or has that been retconned out? Um, it doesn't really come up. Um, when you've got characters that have, this is just my perspective. This is not something, this didn't come in the manual, <laughs> but in, in my opinion, when you've got characters like Clark, Bruce, Hal, John, Diana, whoever, like all these people who have been around for so long and had so many adventures and just done so much, it's hard to look, it's hard to have a straight face and say that they're 28 or whatever. <laughs> you know, like you want them to look young and strong and burly, but honestly, I mean, come on. Are you telling me that Bruce Wayne, Batman, who's had a bajillion Robins, is under 40? Give me a fucking break. Oh, I'm with you, man. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, well, like Ben has always said, if you pull too hard on the thread, the whole tapestry is going to unravel. Yeah, and exactly, great. yeah. Bruce, Bruce and the, the various Robins is a great example of that, absolutely. Yeah, but even even without that stuff, like Hal has done so much, and so has John. So I, I mean, you can certainly find, you know, places in the books where something is said, kind of thrown off, like how old somebody is or how much younger or something. But um, in my opinion, yeah. it's it's best not to look too closely at that kind of stuff because it, it, it starts to you start to realize just how ludicrous it all is. And then it's not as much fun. So I am um, their age has never really come up, honestly, in the conversations. I hope I'm not breaking anyone's heart by saying that it's not that I don't care about the lore, don't care about the about the canon or little details. I totally do. It's sometimes it's just better not to ask because if, if there's an element that doesn't make sense, um, it just makes it hard for the story to, that you're telling to make sense. Well, I have a good question to uh, Jeremy's book regarding Hal, but, you know, I remember certainly in the uh, moments before he became, uh, and again, I'm, I'm blanking on uh, the, during the uh, 90s when they turned Hal evil, you know, he had, he had great temple. So he was <laughs> exactly, like right? 45, something like that. And right. John, with his, um, with his uh, whole war, you know, or, or military experience and everything, I mean, you could, I suppose, still make him, I would say like late thirties or something like that. I would, I would think something like that, but sure. without tying it to a specific number. Sure. You know, yeah, and guy, and you know, Helen guy or, uh, you know, Helen guy were more experienced. So they should yeah. be a, a little bit older. Yeah. When I, the guy, yeah, the books that I remember growing up with whenever I, on the rare occasions I was able to get like a new comic, Hal had gray, gray hair <laughs> at his temples. And, um, but now, Hal doesn't look like that now. Like Hal is very, no. <laughs> he looks he looks very young, and plus yeah. his his whole nature, the way he talks, and this the whole, his whole vibe just seems very youthful. Um, so I just find it better not to ask those kind of questions. Um, I, so I don't e I don't even know the, the question of John's age versus Hal has never come up in uh, in our conversations at DC really. Uh, Ruben wants to know if there are any <laughs> other uh, members of the Lantern Corps you'd like to write a book about. Huh. Um, the first one that came to mind. This this is not this is not what you're asking really. But the first one that came to mind actually was um, a member of the a member of the House of L in my future state. It, you know, thing of a thousand years in the future. One of the twins, not one of the super twins that's been in the in the, the recent books, but one of the House of L twins, like Ronan Kent, who was the. Um, He's the Superman of Earth at that time, and Rowan Kent, his twin sister, who was at that time a Blue Lantern. But in my in my head canon, and this has not been established in the comics anywhere, but in my head canon after that, um, she becomes Lantern L, 
who is a um, someone who has just kind of all the the whole emotional spectrum thing is kind of kind of embodied in her. Like she is the lantern, you know, like she can kind of do it all. And I would love to kind of explore that. Um, but again, that's not in the book anywhere. It's only in my Are brain you, right now. Were you aware? I think it was the 70s where uh, in passing in a Superman story or yeah, I'm pretty sure it was a Superman story that the Guardians considered Cal as a potential Green Lantern. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I, I yeah, remember yeah, yeah. I do yeah, remember yeah, seeing yeah. that. Yeah, like there's a potential Lantern. Yeah, I, I don't remember the details, but I remember that happening. I remember, I remember kind of like the art style. I need to go back and find that comic. Absolutely. And uh, mentioning that Seeking Superman, uh, mentioning Future State, he said uh, you, you you had a complete lineage for the House of L characters. How much background, if any, have you prepared uh, for the Radiant Dead? Um, well, there's uh, you'll see the next couple of issues. Um, it's not quite as complicated as the whole lineage um, that led like a thousand years of you know family tree and all that. But the Radiant Dead come from the Revenant Queen. And we're about to show what the Revenant Queen comes from and how that the Revenant Queen ties into um, the seven God aspects of Algren and the thing that happened that led Algren to be destroyed. Um, like there's a there's a reason that she has the, the uh, she has the crown on. There's a reason that she has that ring and why the the Dark Star symbol is on it. Um, there's a yeah, there's a lot of lore. Probably more than you prefer. If you <laughs> more than more than let me put oh, it in the book. That's great, man. I, that's uh, um, that's wonderful. So yeah, I guess the uh, answer's coming in uh, uh, War Journal yeah, issue. Yeah, answers coming coming real soon. Some of the, uh, many of the answers will come in the next couple of issues of the of this story. But it's also leading to more stuff down the road. I hope I live long enough to do all this stuff. There's like I would love to just yeah. There's a there's a whole lot of lore, and it, it, uh, I really want to just connect a bunch of different parts of the DC universe and yeah. um, just flesh out everything and make it seem seem like newer to the reader, but make it make them see how old everything is behind it. You know. Well, that's the thing. All these all these great creators over these years have kind of thrown these uh, various ideas for DC Cosmic out there. But they've all been, you know, kind of siloed, and it's great that yeah. you're incorporating the dark stars and and thinking about, you know, all right, Kirby's fourth fourth world. Well, what about the, you know, there's three worlds before that. So what what about the first? One? <laughs> right, right. I, you know, any Brian did that a lot in uh, his Superman run, and really had the cosmos yeah, yeah. reacting to what he was doing with Clark and everything. So no, exactly. I love it. Vengeance. Rob V has mentioned he's doing a lot of DC cosmic books coming later this year. I hope you and him are keeping in touch since your stories are very cosmic centric. We are keeping in touch. Rom V is a good friend. I am. Um, yeah. Guy. I love Rom. I really do. Great guy. I know. I do too, man. It's so funny. I, I saw him at uh, last year's C2E2 and I was a little tipsy and I'm just like, seriously, man, <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> that's God, amazing because it's like yeah man, oh, i don't no. mean it in the bad way he goes no i know what you're saying it's cool <laughs> no rom's great i i really love rom i love talking to rom i love his writing um he said that he came to a, a con somewhere and i guess he he met we met probably at new york comic-con one year he said he came to the boom booth and and met me and and just, like shook my hand and we talked like complimented me on a book or something and i don't remember that at all and um I was like, oh man, I hope I, I hope I was nice to you, right? Like, I, that's I'm always I hear these horror stories about people who meet somebody at a con and got treated very rudely, and that's like my nightmare. Like, I no matter so I can't, but, but I I know you too well, man. I, I've yet to see you ever, and maybe I haven't seen the dark side of uh, of Philip Kennedy Johnson, but I I, well, I can't believe you know you've you're always a gracious man. Well, thanks. I I just hear those stories and it just, it just bums me out so much. Like, I got I really. Um, and I've had a couple experiences like that too, where I meet somebody that I just admire so much and they, and they just had a really shit day, you know? Um, and oh, it you, happens. You hate, I agree. yeah. And I, I hate that. So I, no matter, no matter how I'm feeling, how, how I slept, how late I stayed out, whatever I tried, like, don't be that guy today. Do not. And, um, he said it was all fine. Anyway, it was just, it was, uh, it was just funny to hear that I had met cause we were friends by the time I found that out, you know? And he said like, Oh man, I hope, don't I hope that went well. Yeah, I don't remember at all. And Rom's kind of a striking dude. He's like good looking tall dude, like like weird, weirdly beautiful hair, like really strong, really tall. You know, like I don't know. I don't remember you. That's but, well, that's uh, what I told him. I'm like, seriously, man, you got the best hair in comics. And he left. 
you know, but he does. He's a great guy. He's a great guy. I'm, I'm a big yeah, fan. No. And I'm well, always he, happy to see him when he comes well, across we have, the line. We have, we have pretty similar sensibilities too for, for writing. Like we, I think we read a lot of the same stuff. We, um, um, and it's just always fun to talk to him. I was in, I got to, I was in the UK. I, you know this, I was in the UK. Um, guy, when was it? I guess a couple of years ago now. And I made, I made sure to make time to hang out in London with, uh, well, with my friends, Mickey and Jane Laird, who are dear friends and huge fans of the alien stuff and always really gracious. Um, but also Rom and, um, Dan Waters. Uh, oh, that's great. In London. Yeah. We hung out. And saw Alex Pock Nadell who lives in Lancaster and I met Sean Phillips there. I forgot to mention that, um, um, Crocodile Black is kind of like creatively kind of a love letter to Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. I love those guys. I have everything those guys have ever done together. Everything. And I, I buy all their shit side unseen. Um, and <laughs> I was hanging out with Alex and, uh, he has this little group of friends that, that get together now and again. And Sean, excuse me. Um, oh my God. Andy Diggle is one of them. Sure. Who is probably my favorite Constantine writer ever. Like I, and I, I don't say, I don't throw around phrases like that. Like I love so much Constantine. I love Cy Spurrier's Constantine. I love, oh my God, man, Warren Ellis's. There's so many great ones. I think Andy Diggle is my favorite. Andy Diggle just crushes the shit out of Constantine. I loved it. So I got to meet him and I was like starstruck. I mean, I'd met Andy before, but I just love his work. And Sean Phillips is there. And I had never, I've never seen Sean before, but I've seen all his work. Well, Sean looks a whole, <laughs> Sean draws a lot of guys in his books that look kind of like him, you know? So as soon as I walk in, I think Alex goes to the bathroom or something. And um, I see this guy at the bar and I was like, motherfucker, you are Sean Phillips. And I, it was so funny. I, I had no idea what he looked like. I didn't know who I was looking for. But as soon as I saw him, I was like, that's him for sure. Um, it was just really funny. Um, but great guy. Anyway, I'm getting way off track here. But when I, I, no, sure, I love like, it. hanging out with Rom and Dan was like a priority. I love those guys. That's fantastic. All right. She surely has an interesting question. And I certainly remember their romance, but uh, uh, she says, or they, or he says, excuse me, there's a whole other John Stewart in the cosmos looking for Kat Matui, who is effectively a split version of the other John. Will that be addressed by you? Yes and no. So for, uh, for listeners who don't know, yeah, at the end of the Jeffrey Thorne run, uh, Jeffrey wrote, I think in a way to kind of help accommodate the um the dark crisis thing that we were about to do with this alternate universe john there was a there was a split where there became two johns and one of them goes to earth the other one goes off in the cosmos to look for kama Tui, kama Tui, who because of the events of the series he knows is is now alive again somewhere and he goes off to find her um i i really wanted to obviously you can't i, I had no interest in like erasing anything that jeffrey had done i mean jeffrey is a, is hugely devoted to john and I respect every bit of that stuff that Jeffrey did in, the, in that series. I really love how he kind of ties them into the, I mean, the stuff that I'm talking about tying it into the fourth world, Jeffrey already kind of did that. And so the, uh, he makes real connections with the source and the, the power of Oa and all that. Um, so I didn't want to give anyone homework for reading Green Lantern War Journal. I didn't want to put in a lot of references to the other John. I didn't want to bring the other John back in a way that would, confuse new readers you know because that's just a hugely confusing thing to happen in a, in a new series so i decided not to do that so instead um what i did was in, in my in my head canon that like that john has already gone off and done his search and has come up you know empty-handed and has has rejoined with the john that we know okay i don't really i don't really talk about it in the book so as not to throw not to you know screw over new readers but um, I kind of address his ability to do that when I had John create uh, a sentient construct in his sister. He resurrects his own sister. And when they're talking and right after right, that, yeah. he, he, <clears throat> he asks her, do you understand what you are? And she says, I'm part of you. You know, I'm your, I'm your heart and soul and mind and your power and your love for our mama. And I'm not going to let anything happen to her. So we've established he's kind of doing it again. He's making a version of himself again, but in the shape of his sister to take yes. care of him in his own absence. Yep. Um, and there's kind of a price to pay for it that we're going to see. Um, mm -hmm. which I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. But I mean, I, 
a guy, man, all this shit seems to happen in New York. I'm bringing up New York Comic Con over and over. There was this, uh, there was a reader that came up to me in New York Comic Con that, uh, who is, uh, who is professionally a caretaker who takes care of people with dementia. Um, and said, you talked about that thing with John's, John creates his, this construct of his sister to take care of his mom, to basically keep up this fantasy for his mom. And he said, and he told me, you know, John's making a mistake. You're not supposed to do that kind of thing. You're not supposed to keep their fantasies alive. And I'm like, I know, man, but that's what I would do. I mean, are you telling me you wouldn't? Like, if you had this kind of power and your mom is like, it's like scream crying again when she remembers again that her daughter's dead. Yeah. You tell me that you, yeah. I mean, like, are you not going to help? You're just going to say, I'm sorry, mom. She's dead still. I don't know. I don't think I could do it. No. And also, again, it shows the human flaw in John and yeah. also the, the level of power he has as well. It reminds me exactly. again before Hal uh, became Parallax when after uh, Mongol destroyed Coast City, Hal reconstructed Coast City in the green energy form. And yep. it's, you know, yeah, they're not, it's, those are the stories. It's like, wait, man, it's like, they got to make mistakes. I mean, they, you got to, yeah. you got to have that kind of conflict or mistake <clears throat> to show, give them obstacles to overcome essentially, or uh, yes. let's to learn. You the know. thing that John keeps saying in the book is like when he's going up against something impossible, he says, Green Lantern can do anything. That's, that's kind of his, one of his catchphrases in my book. And you know, he's right. They can. And he, so he, so he, he resurrects his sister to take care of his mom. There is a price to pay for it though. And we are going to see, we are going to see that, you know, maybe it is a mistake and we're going to see where that leads, you know, in the, in the issues that come. Well, and again, if people look at seven, you'll start to see the questioning of that decision. Uh, yeah. People yeah. that show up at uh, the reconstructed house that John is right. keeping his mother and his sister in. And uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, we can keep, we can keep it oblique for people to catch up. Yeah. They don't know what we're talking about. A, a little, a little more about that comma two question though. There was, a, yes. I did give, I did give a little Easter egg in um, a little nod in the end of, I think it was an issue six. If you, re, if you remember, there were these other, these other lanterns show up who are um, like <clears throat> loyal to the United planets. So sort of like bad guy lanterns kind of. Yeah. And yeah. One, one of them, Katanak is, um, is from the same planet as Kama Tui and Sinestro. And you can kind of see like he has the same kind of like, yeah they got the they got the pink skin absolutely man right and um as he's he realizes that they made a mistake he's like when he's when he's he's been infected by the radiant dead and he's turning and he cuts his own as he's dying he get he cuts his own hand off and the ring flies away to find a new owner and um he's from that same sector as Kamatui. so that was that was a little a little nod to Kamatui fans like so that's kind of a way in so if we if uh, if i have enough runway to bring Kamatui back, I can, or if another writer is inclined to do that, now we have this opening for Kamatui to have received her new ring, you know? Excellent. No, you know, in fact, you and he said earlier that uh, you were going to explore John's uh, penchant for uh, dating alien women. <laughs> and, uh, obviously, Kamatui came immediately to mind. So, yeah, I didn't want to, yeah. you know, you know, again, we'll let you tell your story then. It's cool. Alex, uh, <laughs> Alex says, love your recent Hulk issue. Would you ever be open to writing a big two event like how uh, King and Black stemmed out of Donny Cates's uh, Venom run. Yeah, man, I'd love to. I mean, it's uh, it's a whole other animal. There's a whole element of like marketing and hustle and stuff and that kind of a thing. Yeah. That uh, that frankly does not interest me. I, I kind of want to just do great work. Somebody was asking me about Hulk 800 and whether I was going to do a big awesome thing for issue 800. And my answer was, I kind of don't think that way. Like, I, I just sort of, I'm, I'm just trying to tell great stories. And I, I am, um, I'm not trying to, I don't know, man, I just don't feel much like a salesman. I feel like there are other people, there are other professionals who do that kind of thing. And sometimes the team will come together and say, hey, we should do something big for this issue. And actually, that that has just recently happened. <laughs> and now we're, we are trying to find a way to, to make the Legacy 800 <clears throat> number kind of special. But that was not like a, um, I think they asked me if I was going to try to stay on the book long enough to write 800 or something. And I'm like, uh, I guess I don't care about that. If, uh, if the end, if my, if the culmination of my, of my story was, had the perfect ending at, you know, 798, I'd be totally fine with that. But, um, anyway, I just, yeah, I, I would be ha totally happy to do a, a, a big two event. Um, I just, I would have to kind of 
reconfigure how I do things and understand that it's, there's going to be like a, a whole like, you know, sales flurry and this, uh, I just need to have, you know, be prepared to do more marketing type yeah. stuff. As far as, as far as the, the writing part of it, I would, I would totally be into that. Um, it's just a whole other kind of challenge. And I, I think I would need to do some real, some real homework and figure out, you know, what the, what I need to do for that kind of thing. Cause I've, I'm, I'm, I'd be new to it. Yeah. I, I assume you're like kind of describing the way like Dan Slott is kind of like the chief writer when a Spider-Man event happens or did happen. And, you know, you, you know, Spider-Verse or something like that. And, you, you know, you get out these other books and he would have a hand in, uh, the other books and how, you know, and almost a de facto editor, right? Is that kind of what you're describing? Yeah, totally. Like I, exactly. Um, I did a, a Captain America three issue mini for the empire event that, um, that Al Ewing wrote and Al was kind of the quote unquote showrunner for that event. Yeah. And so I, I had a lot of questions about what the, ex, what exactly the purpose of that mini was. And I, so I wrote Al this big ass email with all these questions and he patiently, to his credit, wrote me back like a really thorough, like gave me all the answers I needed. It probably took him half yeah. an hour or more to write that damn thing and um, gave me everything I needed to do it. But man, it's just, you're just keeping a lot of plates in the air when you're doing stuff like that. It's a whole other thing. There's just, it's just so much work. And also you have to find a, find a way to make every issue like matter, not have any, any not have any throwaway stories in there, like make it all make sense and matter to readers and keep everyone invested. It's just such a different thing. There's one going on now at Marvel called Blood Hunt that I believe Jed McKay is leading. Um, and my only, my only part in it is uh, I'm just writing the Hulk issue for it. And it's, it's pretty self-contained. It's not for this particular story. There wasn't a whole lot of uh, fuss, but um, cause I just wanted to write a story that would still fit within the, the trade paperback. Like it would still kind of fit in the arc that's happening right now in Hulk. So I kind of kept to, I just kind of stayed in my lane for that one. But well, um, I know when, Sorry. Well, Josh Williamson and I are, are, are tight as well. And when Josh was doing the Dark Crisis stuff, man, he took that thing seriously. And he just, I know how much work he was putting into that book. And, sure. Uh, damn, it's a lot of work. So it's just a whole other thing. And I'm, I'm pretty ignorant of what all goes into it, really. Well, yeah, you, you know, to f listen, again, for the 19 years I've been doing the podcast, I've seen uh, events go well, and I've seen events not go well. And like you said, when the, when the writer is the de facto showrunner, <laughs> You know, I, I'm not surprised that Al took the time to answer all your questions and give you a real detailed answer. Because yeah, man, you don't you don't want any portion of the story that you're not writing yourself to be half-assed or really kind of miss the point. I uh, God, I remember poor poor Matt Fraction. Uh, they did Fear Itself was one of uh -huh. his events at Marvel, and it just didn't it didn't gel. And I and I asked him about it, and I felt horrible because Matt really was really kind of bummed that it just didn't gel and work the way he wanted it to. And I even said, I'm like, you know, man, I, I, I'm really not picking on you, but you know, I'm just curious from that intellectual standpoint, like, you know, and maybe he was still too close to the event, but I'm like, yeah, what, what do you think happened? What do you think went wrong? And it was tough for him to say. And again, I'm like, God, I feel like I'm like, you know, his older brother going, yeah, you fucked up. And, I, and I'm like, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> man, it's the tricky thing about that kind of thing is that, a lot of those books are like those events are judged on sales more so than quality sometimes. And that sucks. You know, so agree. So I, agree. I'm just not interested in that. I guess I, it would, it would be really, it would be rough to have people say, Oh, this run was a failure because of, you know, Amazon, Amazon paper shortages or because of um, some other event that happened right before yours, or because of some kind of a, a rotation of artists that didn't work out in your favor or, um, I don't know, man. I, I, I that would that would really suck, you know. I put a lot of love into the stories I write, and I I just have to hope that that um, that readers find them. But I'm just, you know, I un I understand that in comics. I mean, comics are the joining of of art and commerce, and they have to sell to exist. I totally understand all that. But um, you know, it's not. I do everything I can to help the books move. But I know there yeah. there are more talent there are more talented people to do that. And it, would, it would just really suck to have your work judged on on sales and not on the love you put into it or the artist put into it. No, I get it, man. And again, I, I hear you know it's funny. Vengeance says uh, John Hickman is uh, the perfect event guy. To be honest, yeah. But listen, I've seen John Hickman's notebooks on not only event books but also his own books. And John, it, much like John Stewart, John Hickman is a builder, and John is always thinking about 
the interconnections, and you see it in the graphics that he includes in his books. I mean, so yeah, he's got he's got the head for it, and I certainly respect that. But you know, no, Philip, I, I hear you, man. You just want to tell a good story at the end of the day. God bless you, you know. I mean, you know, that basic. So, oh, that's fun. Uh, and I didn't know you had a. a uh, Ruben wants to know. It really hopes you can do your Batman Scarface story someday. I didn't know you had one. That's I cool. do. I've got a. I've got a story in the back of my head called Dummy that I really want to do. That's great. Um, I yeah. the ventriloquist and Scarface are really fantastic. And I, I and know. I've, I've, yeah, I'm a big fan. You ever hear the no, BBC I'm, I'm Radio? Sure. The BBC Radio adaptation of Nightfall, and the and oh, ventriloquist and Scarface are in it, and it's so great to hear somebody doing. The bad ventriloquist, you know, the G for B, and I'll, I was just going to yeah. ask. Yeah, dude, I've got to, I've got to find that. Yeah, I, I love that character. I feel like that's that's a character that's pretty underutilized. I, I think, uh, I think Two Face is awesome. Two Face, the way that uh, Christian Ward did Two Face in his City of Madness recently, God, it was perfect. I love the way he. I mean, I almost don't want to see him any other way now. In, in my opinion, Two Face is there's a there's a there's a world in which Two Face is the Joker, like a, where Two Face is like the 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 proper the nemesis for Batman, you know. Sure. But Scarface is one to me that is very underutilized. I feel like he's he just really captures the the mental illness and theatricality of the perfect Batman Rogues Gallery, you know. I mean. It's hard to say perfect because you, you see the same thing in Two Face and Scarecrow and Joker, and there's such a great, great rogues gallery. But man, Scarface is just so dope. I know, I, I love it. I love the ventriloquist, just kind of along for the ride. Yes, <laughs> you know, and so meek and everything, as Kem Dog yeah, says. Yeah, seems like he doesn't. Got uh, Yeah, there. right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> I, know, I, lo I love that the ventriloquist seems to not even want, or like really want to be there. Right. I am. Um, I actually actually know somebody. I can't even get into details because it's so screwed up. But I, I know somebody um, who has their own struggle with mental illness in there, and um, they also and they make doll. They literally make dolls. And um, man, there's a there's a story there, and I, I, the story that I would tell is not based on that one at all. But I, it has kind of given me a little a little window into into that whole thing. I don't know. I, I would love to do a story about 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 dummy about the ventriloquist, you know, and see him try to try to live this certain life, but this other one kind of intrudes upon it and how it all kind of gets out of, you know, out of control. It's a sh and I don't even know, cause there are so many Batman titles right now. If there is a book like uh, legends of the dark Knight was in the nineties and early 2000s, oh, no. cause that would be the great place for something like that. <clears throat> yeah. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. The, the story I'm thinking of is very much a, uh, a, a black label kind of book and it would, it would, it would really sing with a, a really distinct artist, like honestly, like Christian Ward, but also like somebody like, like jock, somebody that's where the, the art just almost like this really harsh garish, but beautiful kind of, Oh God, I, I can I'm see it in my mind's eye. It would, it would be awesome. No, I'm uh, with yeah. you. Kim, Kim Doc says something nice about your Hulk run. He says, I've been collecting the Hulk for 35 years. This run is a definite favorite. Let's talk about the story right now, because the Hulk's in New Orleans. He still yeah. has uh, he, Bruce is still watching over that kid. Uh, yeah. you know. Well, and, yeah, Bruce is Bruce has just lost her for a bit. And um yeah, yeah and there's Betty, the, Betty's uh like, Betty's back in the story. Yeah, right. Yeah. So yeah, Betty's around. Betty is under the thumb of the uh, of eldest, the the eldest of the mother of horrors. And um man, it's it's cool to see Betty back in the story. But I, it's also been really fun to kind of explore the relationships between, between Bruce and Hulk, between Bruce and Charlie, and between Charlie and Hulk, how they all kind of have different relationships with each other. Yep. Um, and in this current arc, issues nine through eleven, of which nine and ten are out, takes place in New Orleans, as you say, and um, it deals with this creature called Frozen Charlotte that I'm really proud of. It kind of has, kind of has ties to, you know, Christian mythology. Oh, well, okay, Christian mythology. Don't come at me, internet. Sorry. To like you know, you know, angels and demons and that kind of stuff. That's all right. Um, there's this big, uh, this these these catacombs that we show uh, under New Orleans, which is not a thing because the water table in, in New Orleans is like the ground. Um, but oh, man, I'm I'm really excited. Danny Earls is doing the art, and uh, on this particular arc, there's been um, like the the main ongoing artist is still Nick Klein. Yes, the court has been just crushing it everyone is just freaking out about how great nick's art is 
And man, Danny Earls is an unsung hero on this book. He's doing the arc right now. And yeah. so when, when he didn't, when he did issue nine, I think some people were still expecting, um, Nick. expecting Nick and they're like, Oh, it's not Nick Klein. I'm like, dude, look at what Danny is doing. His, his uh, environments are so atmospheric. It's just ludicrous how good he is. Do you know Danny Earls? Like how he kind of got into the industry? No, first I've seen him is uh, reading your Hulk stuff. Go ahead. Oh, well, that's, I'm glad to hear that. But he, so Danny Earls was a professional footballer. He's a soccer player. Um, and he just wow. loved comics. Yeah, he just wanted he just wanted to draw comics while he was doing that. So he just he's just drawing constantly. And at some point, he's like, "Screw it, I'm going to do this." Wow. And yeah. Uh, so he's a, he's an Irish guy. He lives in Dublin, and he was at a con. I want to say in Danny. Er excuse me. In a, he was at a con in Leeds, I believe, and uh, Gail Simone was there, and finds Danny at the table drawing Batman stuff. And Gail is just blown away by how good he is. And she basically Twitter bombs DC, like hire this guy to do Batman right now, or you're an idiot. And they did. <laughs> like they, <laughs> they hired him to do, to do some stuff. I think cool. a short story, I think, but he's, I mean, so he just kind of, everyone's suddenly looking at Danny and now suddenly he's getting work like just book after book after book that he would have, you know, done anything to do not long ago. So he did a, I believe he did a Punisher thing. He did an alien thing. He's doing Hulk with me now. Um, he's got some other big stuff coming up soon. He's, um, he's just crushing it, but I'm going to keep him as long as I can on Hulk. Cause he's, I love his work. Um, but his strengths are so different than Nick's. And I, I just love his environment so much. Um, so new Orleans seemed like the, the perfect city for, for Danny's story. So we're he he's just, uh, that grunge of New Orleans, you know, that exactly. is there with all the exactly. beautiful French Quarter stuff and everything. Yeah. Yeah. New Orleans is so gross, but so amazing, <laughs> you know, and it, and he shows all that on the page. He makes the he makes the French Quarter look just like it should. Um, I love it. I love the alleyways. I love the catacombs. Uh, again, I know the catacombs aren't real, but it, it, he also shows this uh, this cemetery there. That's really great. And a potter's field kind of across the street, which is also a real place. Um, he's, uh, they're in the cemetery and Charlie's never traveled. Charlie's just his kid from Kentucky as I was. And she never, she's never been anywhere. So they're walking through this amazing cemetery and she's like, Oh my God, what is this place? And Bruce is like, what do you mean? It's a cemetery. He's like, yeah, why does it look like this? Cause there's all these, you know, crypts above the ground and everything. Right. Right. And he says, the water table's like right at the surface. If you, you can't bury bodies here, they That's just, bury bodies. Just, well, they'll come back up eventually. Right. And literally, like, well, literally at Easter dinner yesterday, I don't know how we got on the subject. We were absolutely talking about New Orleans and the fact that they need to have uh, burials above ground because of the water tables and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, and then she's like, what about those bodies over there? And there's a, you know, there's a, there's a potter's field. It's really like a really, you know, a, a less expensive place to be buried. And he's like, well, that's potter's field. It's where they bought, you know, it's where they bought, bury prisoners or people that don't have anybody or there's no money. It's like, yeah, but won't they come up too? He's like, yeah, but nobody cares about those bodies. And that that whole nihilistic view of that whole situation just oozes off the page. Like Danny's work is so good. Um, anyway, I just it's a very different style. So I really try to write to the contrast between the artists, you know. I hope to um, uh I hope to meet him when I'm in Dublin uh in that the week after Terrificon. I'm going to Dublin. It may kill really? me. I hope it may kill me. I don't know if I can handle back to back. <laughs> And plus transcontinental uh, <laughs> travel, but uh, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm excited. And also I'll be honest, I'm a little nervous. I'm literally, I can't like, wait to get, uh, yeah, I'm going to be there. doing, I'm going to be doing some teaching over there soon. Hey, that's awesome. Which do you yeah. know what school? Well, it's, it's a new Academy. It's just opening up. I, there's a, it's, this is all very, it's just, just barely happening, you know? So I still, I, I gotta, I gotta actually pitch the course and everything, but it's, it's happening though. I'm pretty excited it's, about it. We'll talk more about it. Okay. Cause Owen McCauley, who's tied to the, Dublin Comic Cons. He's the uh -huh. guy that's invited me over there and everything. I met oh, him. In awesome. New, I met him in New York in 2018, and no, I mean you know then COVID happened, and um, they just had their March convention. I was originally supposed to go then, and unfortunately I couldn't make it. So therefore, um, uh, he's like, or rather more so, he's like, hey, we over we overspent our budget bringing Americans over. Can we uh -huh. move you to the August show? I'm like, no problem, man. And so yeah, I'll be I'll be going the week after. Terrific. 
So Owen Owen is the one that's setting up this academy. I wondered because I know he's yeah. got his new school. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great yeah, guy. Yeah, that's it. Wonderful yeah, guy. Totally. Actually, I'm sitting on some uh, panels that they did for uh, the March Dublin show, and uh, I will be uh, I'll be putting those out this week. So uh, yeah, well, yeah. Put in a, put in a good word for me. I really like Owen. Oh, 100 percent. No, sweetheart of a guy. Absolutely great animator. Uh, loves Zorro. And uh, yeah, he's a, he's a very cool dude. And actually, I'll be teaching podcasting over there. Uh, oh, I that's think amazing. In the that follow, yeah, the, uh, the the convention and everything. So well, you're the guy. Oh, you're the guy to do that job. That's great. Stanley John is becoming a jet setter. Now I don't know about that. Although yeah, it is, exactly. it's my first European trip since literally everybody 2000, 24 years ago. Is the last time I was in Europe. I hate nice. to admit it, but it's true. <laughs> well, so too crazy. Fan. Yeah, please. Pay him respects to Danny as well. Danny's a hell of a good guy. Yeah, I hope to meet him, man. Because really, I you know Steve Mooney out there and Dex Shalvey. I'm I'm excited right. to see those guys and everything, and we're gonna hang out. And uh, yeah, and God, you know Owen is awesome because he knows my love for boxing. And uh, the great featherweight champion Barry McQuigan, the Clone Cyclone, is still in, in still in Dublin. And he goes, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna do what I can to get him to come out to the convention to meet you, John. I'm like, oh my God, that'd be one of my truly favorite fighters of. 40 years ago, the early 80s and shit. What a great guy. I'm like, oh, please. That would be wonderful to meet Barry McGuigan. So, <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, Gary has a good question in asking how you're finding the alternating artists on Hulk. Uh, Jeff uh, Parker often spoke a lot about creating different types of stories with their own vibes for uh, Dex Shalvey, and I'm forgetting which Kev uh, it might have been back then, on uh, his run on Thunderbolts. Yeah, that's you should absolutely write to the write to the strengths and tastes of your artist. Um, I don't actually find these guys. I so it was Nick Klein. I mean, the the, the fact that Nick uh, Nick was going to be on the book is one of the one of the perks that got me out of the book in the first place. I mean, I, I probably would have done it in any case. But when they was when they said, "Yeah, we're thinking about Nick Klein," I'm like, "Yeah, do that, and I'll I'll be there." But then when we were a few issues in, they're like, "We want to bring in." Um, <laughs> they were talking about bringing in. Um, Oh my God, I'm a horrible person. The guy that did the Swamp Witch is issues, um, he did. He drew Animal Man with Jeff Lemire. Oh, jeez. Help me, uh, Chad. Yeah, Travis Charest, right? No. Or Travel Foreman. Travel Foreman. Travel Foreman. Sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. They asked me about Travel Foreman, which obviously I was excited about. And, um, you know, I wrote, I reached out to Travel to see what kind of stuff they like to draw. And I did the same thing. When they talked about Danny, Jesus, I like, totally jumped on that. Like, yes, please get Danny. Um, and you know, introduce me by email so we can figure out how to do this. I just wanted to. I want. I uh, I always ask artists what they like to draw. Like, how what do they most like to draw? What do they like to see in a script? Um, how much direction do you want? Um, if it's somebody with a you know, if if uh, somebody from you know a foreign country, sometimes I'll ask the editor like, are they is English their first language, or do I need to write a certain different kind of way, or just to make sure that they get everything they need from the script, you know? Um, so, and then I look at their other, at their other work. Usually the, uh, the editor will often put together a little packet. If it's somebody that's not famous, they'll put together a packet of that person's work and send it to me so I can see it. But usually that's kind of cherry picked of their best stuff. So usually I'll go back and I'll, I'll look through issues like full issues that they've done, usually full runs that they've done and just see what they're best at, you know? Um, so yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I think it's important to go back and see, look at their body of work and, um, just see, see what, what makes their work sing. Excellent, man. Very, very cool. Are you cool for time then? Cause it's late your time. I don't want to mess you up. It's I got like a little ten. bit. <laughs> so I will say tomorrow, my band goes on tour tomorrow. So I got to pack yet. <laughs> so, but we'll let's do it. Let's, if there's questions and stuff, let's talk a little longer. All right, I'm looking around. Someone had asked uh, how, and, and you started to tell it right now, uh, your writing process and how, you know, does the script start with you and, you know, when when do you start thinking about the artist and everything? But I, I can't find the, the the comment right now, unfortunately. Yeah, so. it's, I always want to know who, um, who I'm writing for when possible. Every now and then there's a situation where we don't know yet. Well. <clears throat> but most of the time I know who the artist is going to be. And uh, I try to find out what they what they like to do, what they've done, how they work best, blah blah blah. So I'll write the full script. It'll go to the editors. Um, there might be some notes about something. Then it'll get revised. I'll revise it, you know, and I'll send it back again. 
usually is good at that point. Um, and then it'll go to the artist and hopefully there's a lot of interaction between yeah. us. I like usually, uh, ideally the way it goes is the artist will do many pages of, of, uh, of thumbnails, like just kind of kindergarten sketches of what the pages will be just to show us the, the perspectives and, um, the, the panel layout and all that, just to see roughly yeah. how it will go. Like, Hey, how does this work? And if there's anything weird, <clears throat> um, I might just bring up a couple of things to think about. Like, Hey, what about just literally asking questions? Like, what if we turn the perspective around from, from this guy's shoulder to this other shoulder or, you know, there's not really anything of, like I was, I was envisioning these two shots as close ups. Could we do, you know, what do you think? Or I think it gave you too many panels in this page. Very often the notes that I have after that is, um, the, the notes are often for myself. Like sometimes uh, if a page comes back too cluttered, I, I, I'll go back and kind of tweak, tweak the writing a little bit to, you know, to help them out a little bit before they, they move forward. Yeah. Uh, that, when there's thumbnails, that's when you make the comments like, Hey, let's change this, 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 or if there's nothing, there's nothing. And that's great. And then they'll, they'll do the pen, the pencils after that. And again, you're checking it out to make sure everything's good. Um, and every now and then something will get missed in the script or, there will be some little detail that's important for an upcoming thing. And you might have to call it out. Like, actually, we really need to see this mirror on the wall and here's why um, that kind of stuff. And then the inks will come back when it's inked. Usually it's pretty much locked in. You don't be making comments after the inks. Cause that's kind of a dick move. Um, ideally you want to give notes before it gets inked. And I mean, sometimes it's, it doesn't matter so much. Sometimes depending on their workflow, the pencils need to be the same stage, you know, it might, might be done all at once if it's done digitally. So then it doesn't matter quite as much. Um, Understood. And then it goes to the colorist and the letterer at the same time. And then you get the, you look over those two. You want the whole thing to be conversation all the way through. You don't want it to be, you don't want to just finish it and send it and not think about it again. You ideally want to tweak everything as it goes, you know? I understand. Haas uh, loves your work on uh, Green Lantern War Journal. I suggest, Haas, that you rewind and listen to that portion of the show where uh, or, or video and, uh, listen to what we were talking about regarding yeah thanks story. for the thanks for the kind words though man. i appreciate that a lot and michael says uh reading war world the giant trade paperback i want to say thanks for spinning such a great yarn so uh, that's thank cool. you so much it's it's an honor and funky dude do you read uh any indie comic universes like spawn or hellboy or are you interested in writing for those universes you know i don't read spawn these days um I, I have I did in the past, and um, I like the Sam and Twitch stuff that Bendis did a long time ago. Um, Hellboy yeah. is is one of my favorite series ever. Um, and in fact, since we're already kind of doing the, the field trip oh, stuff here, zoom in on uh, Phillips' uh, work area here. Let's see here. <laughs> got the got the full library set here. Yeah, they are. Okay. Yes, indeed. Wow. Let's see, let's see one of these. One of these cre uh, contains the Crooked Man. Where are you? There's a. Uh, uh, I'm not going to take all these off the shelf. Anyway, right. there was um, yeah, there's there's a uh, Hellboy, the Crooked Man, okay. with uh, with Bignola and um, Richard Corbin, is probably the most influential story on um, my Hulk run. Wow, that takes that takes place in the American South, and it's just this incredibly haunting and beautiful, like, witch story, basically. And like the, this, the Southern Gothic vibe of it is just amazing, man. I mean, the way Corbin draws the whole thing, it just it just looks like the South in this really haunting way, and um, the the monsters are so compelling and cool. It just feels like actual folklore. I love the whole setup of of Hellboy just being this lightning rod for for this whole world of mythology and witchcraft and folklore that the rest of us are, don't get to see, you know. When Mike uh finds uh well he doesn't find them there they exist and they're great artists, but I do love when Mike pairs up with guys like Corbin and Gary Gianni as well. Uh Gary Gianni did a great at sea Hellboy story a couple years ago. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I love when Mike draws his own stuff, but it is, it's fun seeing the various uh, greats that he manages to uh, collaborate with. Yeah, it's pretty neat stuff. Um, oh, Chemdog says he's lucky enough to have Seeds of Destruction in any series in floppies. I'm sure that's worth a lot of money, my man. Yeah, dude. 
there's a um when I wrote the Hulk stuff, I really like the um the kind of the the chapters, like the, the way that uh, each Hellboy story is kind of its own thing. And between that and the um, a lot of the Marvel stories that I had uh, growing up, there were a lot of like a lot of one shots or or two parters, like really short arcs. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do that in Hulk too, although that is about to. It's funny, I've actually gotten some feedback from fans that they'd like to see a little more like there's this kind of, there's this underpinning to the Hulk story that drives the whole thing forward about like the mythology, like the eldest and the mother of horrors and why, why all these monsters are kind of coming after Hulk. It was this setup because I wanted all these different, these little short arcs. Um, Cause I, I just love that setup as a kid where you could just jump in anywhere in the story and not have to not have, you know, dozens of issues you had to read for homework to get caught up, you know? Sure. Um, but going forward, we are like, people have been really curious about eldest and mother of horrors and the um, like, what, what the backstory is. So starting in this next, in, in this month's issue in issue 11, there's this huge change to status quo that happens. So the, the monster of the month setup is about to be kind of busted up for a bit. <laughs> and there's going to be, there's going to be more, more lore oh, coming yeah. from the, the from uh, from eldest, I um a lot of it is kind of born out of a lot of the the lore that I saw and see in these old Silver Surfer and Thor issues. There's when, uh, the stuff about the Demi Urge and um, and the Demi Gorge and Set and Gaia and all that stuff. Kind of like these these ancient horrors of of Earth, like how Earth came to be and everything. I wanted to tie it all in with. The, the green door and the one below all and everything that Al Ewing did so capably in the, in the mortal Hulk. So that's going to all start like starting basically now <laughs> starting in, the, in this next little bit, this next trade paperback worth of stories. Basically we're going to see a lot of backstory uh, like why eldest needs Hulk like she does, why she hates him like she does what those things in that crypt were at the beginning of issue one, what all, what, you know, what the meaning of all that stuff, like the big headless Hulk body that's in there, how that got to be there. Um, you can see it even from the covers that Nick just turned in the covers for a couple of the upcoming issues. And even when you just see the covers, you'll understand like, Oh my God, here comes some more lore. We're going to see some mythology stuff. Um, so anyone who, who wants to see more forward momentum on the, like the umbrella story, like that's, that's all coming like immediately. That sounds great, man. No, you know, honestly, I'm I'm uh, coming off of such a, a such popular runs on Hulk the last the last couple of years. You found a new uh, vein to explore Hulk stories, and I think you're doing a hell of a job. And uh, I know Thank a lot you. of people agree. Absolutely, man. Appreciate so, that. Well, you know, hey, let's wrap up and uh, remind everybody uh, beyond Hulk and Green Lantern War Journal, uh, there is uh, Crocodile Black starting next month for boom and to whet your appetite it's a couple images uh yeah. for the, uh, the covers uh these two from uh sorrentino and uh christian ward and oh man not okay so that's all cool and of course uh yeah next uh in a, just a couple of weeks uh we'll get john stewart and uh green lantern war journal issue eight and we'll read the book of oa and a lot yeah, will be explored exactly. the, time with the other so the that's book of great OA that uh <laughs> that that guy Gardner keeps in his uh in his closet under his boots. So, <laughs> yeah, we go. got the tweets. I know guys coming, so uh that's great to see. And I, I do I, I love when the lanterns get together and uh you know they're they're different voices when they merge and meld. I, I always think that's always interesting stuff. So Philip oh, is thanks. always congrats, you're killing it. Oh, thanks, brother. Always good to see you. So, thanks same. for having me on. Absolutely. Everybody, thanks a lot for watching. Um on the audio side, I'm going to present these uh, panels from Double Econocon this week. I, I'm trying to see because I'm off tomorrow night, and I think the next time we're going to do a Word Balloon Live is Thursday night, and it's going to be uh, the off-postponed uh, uh, conversation with Alex Segura. He keeps these postponing. It's driving me nuts. John, I'm really sorry. <laughs> I know it's day of, but I really need today. Can we move it next week? Twice. So this is the third attempt. Uh, but I'm a big I'm a big Dick Tracy nut. I'm also going to talk to the co-writer Mike Morisi. I'm very excited about this Mad Cave run. Oh, Mike's That's great. Up on Dick Tracy, I think it's going to be really cool. So join cool. us for that. Um, there'll be a tribute, as I said, uh, and uh, we'll uh, replay uh, a great Ed Pisker conversation. I think tomorrow for Word Balloon, and a whole lot more. So it's going to be a fun April. I've already uh, set up 
in principle conversations with uh, Sanford Green. Pardon me, Sanford Green coming back. Jeremy Burp. Oh, Sanford Green is coming up. And, uh, <laughs> and Jason Aaron is coming up too in a couple of weeks. So that's going to be a oh, lot man. of fun. Jason's been awesome, man. Jason has been so cool. Um, he and I met a long time ago when I was, he was doing Conan and I was a massive fan of, I mean, of classic Conan, but also what he was doing. Sure. Um, and I was doing last God at the time. So we talked kind of nerded out and Robert E. Howard a little bit in the, in the, the sure. bar. It was another kind of a Ron V situation, except now I was on the other side of the table. Cause he, he and I spoke at the, the Marvel party and, um, and then later on, when he's about to take over Action Comics, he did not remember that story. So we talked about that stuff again, and we talked about Superman quite a bit, and hung out. He and I and Steve Orlando hung out a good bit, and um, oh, that's great! Just a lovely guy, and um, yeah, always great to get, great to see him at a con. No, Jason's been a longtime friend, uh, scalped, and even before that, exactly. Yeah, the other, the other side is great war uh, comic that he wrote right. in the early aughts and everything. Oh yeah, yeah. So God, no, it's so, not... so much epic work. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's been a while since Jason's been on War Balloon, so no, I'm glad he... I'm like, dude, it's been forever. He goes, yeah, you're right. I'm coming back. So I'm like, good. So coming up in a couple of weeks, everybody. So that's enough of a tease of what's coming up on War Balloon Live. Thanks a lot for watching tonight. Stay safe, stay happy, stay healthy.